So tell me, how are you? How do you feel? Do you feel confident? Safe? Secure? How would you feel if suddenly the doors burst open and armed men ran in, shooting, shooting off their guns in the air, screaming and shouting that they'll kill the men here, it might be you, and that they'll rape the women, it might be me, it might be you, it might be you, and that they might make some of the men rape their wives or their sisters or even their babies. Because that is what it's like for most women in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. So every time you go out, maybe go down to the shops, or when you go to sleep at night, can you really feel secure? And that's the kind of life that they're living right now. I first went to Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo in October 2001, and it was the height of the Second War, what they call Africa's First World War. And there, women told me about a horrifying, terrifying choice that they were having to make. They could either stay at home and starve, or they could go out, look for food, and run the risk of being raped. And of course, as most of them were the main providers for their families and for their children, they didn't really have any choice at all. They had to go out. And at that time, in this town where I was called Shabunda, Médecins Sans Frontières, the uh, NGO Doctors Without Borders, told me that 70% of the women had been raped once. So today, in Congo, unfortunately, women tell me a different story. They tell me that they expect to be raped now. But not just once, two, three, maybe four times. And the girl children, the girl babies that they have from rape, are raped too. In a report published in 2011 in the American Journal of Public Health, they estimated that 400,000 women are raped every year. That's 48 an hour. 48 women raped every hour. And the United Nations has called Congo the rape capital of the world. But I'm not here today to talk just about the horrors of Congo, because I'm here to tell you an inspirational story. I think it's an inspirational story about one woman. She's a survivor of multiple sexual violence, of acts of sexual violence where she's been raped by groups of soldiers, and yet she's helped thousands of other survivors, women, men, children, and babies, over the last decade and more. And her name is Masika Katsuva, and I've been following her and her work since 2009. So first of all, I'd like you to see her uh, in a trailer of a feature documentary film that I've recently finished called Seeds of Hope. So play the film. Kibona kama si wa mama Mungu alitupatia kitu kimoja kinyi tunaona kinatafutiwa na kila mtu. Sasa kile mtu anaweza kuwa anatembea tu. Unakutana na gari na gonga mtu. Kumkuta unambana unaingia na kile kipa. Mwanafaa tafanya kisha maza mbaka unamua mtoto hakuna tena kuhesabia miaka nikaanza tukatoto hata kapata hivi tunakabaka kisha tunajende ni kwa na waza vile wa menaribisha usichana kipali tena siku mtu msimu Je ne sais pas si tu as vu que 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 t
Mimi wangu hana wa kuita papa ni mnasikia. Tunangoa kama ni mwaka afike kusegondere. Akwe mkuu kisha tunafanya fete tunafanya hiyo anniversary yake. Naweza umia kimoyo lakini utakufaa tu mwisho utafute kumudisha uhali yake ya zamani kupitia mashauri. Shamba tunaenda tunaenda. Na sasa tutakuwa tunakutana na vile mafikiri tena hata tena nabadilika sana juu utaona mwingine ili yenyewe anaishi na wengine yenyewe wanaishi. Alioitenda yote ilikuwa ni kwa imani. Na sasa tunapanda shamba hii Mungu tunajua mwenyewe utazidisha na utachunga. Mazao ya mimea Mungu najua siku moja utakula madimbuko. So who is Masako? What's make what inspires her? What makes her different? Well, she was just an ordinary person, though a wife and a, a mother until 2000 when men broke in, armed men broke into her house, murdered her husband in front of her, raped her and her two teenage daughters. She was thrown out of the family home by his relatives and she literally took a, what she could take in a plastic bag with her two teenage daughters who were both pregnant. And she said that when she was in hospital, because she was physically very badly injured, it was the kindness of the other women who helped her that inspired her to look after women now. And since 2000, she's developed an extraordinary holistic program where she provides um, shelter, basic provision, health care, education for children. She even goes out and looks for them. She has a network of volunteers who tell her about attacks on villages and by word of mouth, where people will come and come to her center, or sometimes she'll walk for days, literally, up mountains to find a village and find somebody who's been raped. And sometimes she even physically carries them on her back, back down to the shelter. And she's a tiny, tiny woman, and she will carry them. She provides clothes. Some women have told me that when they were found by massacre, they were naked. They were in the forest with no clothes, literally nothing. She takes them to the hospital. Some of them may need long-term health care. And she also almost literally collects babies. At the moment, there are 40 children and babies at her center that she's looking after. But one of the two, two of the really important things she does um, are reconciliation and a kind of wider community program. Because many of these women, as she was, are rejected by their family and their husbands, and they're left completely ostracized, often with many children to try and provide for. So she tries to reconcile the, the husband and with the family to bring them back. Because one of the most powerful and, and terrible things about this use of rape as a weapon of war is that it breaks down families, it shatters communities, and it fractures society. And so what she's doing is trying to mend that back from the grassroots up. And what she also does, which is very unique, is that she helps find women uh, houses and places to live in the community. And when she has money to rent or buy land, they come together once a week to work together in a field. And one of the things I did in the film was to uh, film over a period of time to see the preparation, the planting, and then the harvesting of a field. Because women come once a week and they work together, not just for practical reasons where they can share the harvest and they can either use the produce and eat it and feed their families, they can sell it if they make enough. They can replant it and generate more crops and more income. But it brings them together. There, all of them have experienced the same thing. And they all have a, a language they understand. And it's all part of that healing process that Massacre is managing to create and bring together. So let's have a quick look at just briefly what some of the women in Massacre says about what they're doing. Kufuna na kwa fujo na kwa karamu ya jabu ni wana imbaka 
ndio kila mtu anapiga rishaka aongole mbio mbio aongole mingi aliko walogote na mimi kaoke Mungu <laughs> So what's the future for women in Congo? Are they going to be sentenced to an endless cycle of rape and violence? Or is there a way of stopping this? Well, I, I believe there is. I believe that it is possible to end impunity and that it's already starting. Um, and that justice can be done by restoring the rule of law. Cynics will always say it's never going to happen, and it's very easy to be cynical about Congo, and I think that's the, the easy way out. But things are changing, because since 2009, with the support of the international community, there have been mobile courts that have been held in different areas, in an area called South Kivu, which is actually the province where Massacre Center is. And since 2009, in 36 months, they've held 200 and 82 cases with 204 convictions of rape. So something is happening. And is this a one-off? Is this something that's going to end? Well, maybe not, because significantly, a very important trial may be about to take place. Because a year ago today, the Congolese army went on the rampage in Minova, the town nearest massacre center. And having been defeated and uh, withdrawn to Minova after engaging with the M23 rebels who have just recently surrendered, they went on the rampage and they raped many people. Human Rights Watch did a report soon afterwards and estimated that they raped 79 women and children. Massacre told me that on the 22nd of November last year, she received 130 cases of women and children, 17 of which were under the age of 18, and the youngest girl was 11. Well, the Congolese authorities have actually been gathering witness testimonies, and they've gathered, I believe, 179. They think that they've got 179 cases or a few more than that. So what is actually happening? Well, just over a week ago, on the 15th of November, the first hearings were held. Because for months they said that there would be trials and nothing happened. I met with a prosecutor in February in Congo, and he promised me that there would be trials in May. And that they had a, a utmost responsibility to send a message to Congolese soldiers that this was not going to happen again, that this could not happen again, that the Congolese army had a responsibility to protect Congolese civilians, which hadn't happened on this occasion. So what has happened is despite the trials not going ahead in May, they are going ahead. And so that is, you know, a sign that something positive is going to happen. And it's absolutely vital. Massacre herself says, we women are in agony. And she continues to receive survivors of rape. Since September, she's had 24 new victims of rape at her center. There are 184 women in the wider community that she's supporting who go and work in the field with her. And she's also caring for 40 children at the center, three of which she recently had to take to hospital. And tragically, one of them died. But so if people tell you that Congo, as Joseph Conrad wrote, is still the heart of darkness, I'd like you just to remember Massacre and her work. Every day, going out, finding new people, 
supporting the women, helping the children. So I'd just like to leave you with a final clip of Massacre so that you can finish with her in mind. naisha kule kuma hopla tu kama hali ya kubaka itaisha kana mimi sizipenda iendelee nitapenda iishe lote kesho ile ni association huko watoto huko wa mama tunaweza endelesha ingine ma activity kulima inaweza isha na mimi siwezi gairi leo vita iishe wala ubakaji iishe lote ile ndio mimi najua iishe lote Yeah. And see you in the next